Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's lecture in the Pandemic 101 series. My name is Jenna Spinelli. I'm the communication specialist for the McCourtney Institute for Democracy here in the College of the Liberal Arts. Before I introduce today's guest, I wanted to set a few ground rules for today's presentation and let you know about some other resources available for the class of 2024. We are excited to have some members of the class of 2024 with us today. Uh, we will leave time for questions at the end of the presentation, but um, feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box at any time throughout the lecture. I will be collecting them and reading them at the end. And if you do have questions uh, about your next steps as an accepted student at Penn State, uh, you can feel free to reach out to our recruitment coordinator, Chantel Harley. Um, you can find her information on the Perspectives Students page of the Liberal Arts website, which is la.psu.edu. Uh, so again, you can find Chantel's information at la.psu.edu. And now I am delighted to introduce today's speaker, Eduardo Mendieta, Professor of Philosophy and Affiliate Faculty Member in the Rock Ethics Institute and the Latino Studies Program here in the College of the Liberal Arts. His lecture will explore the language that we use to talk about the COVID-19 pandemic and what that language reveals about how we're dealing with the crisis that we're facing. The writer William Burroughs famously wrote that language is a virus. And so I'm very excited to hear about all of the ways that those two things intersect. So take it away, Eduardo. Thank you, Jenna. Um, it's so great to be here on this series of lectures. I wanna thank Professor Marsh, John Marsh for having invited me. And um, I also wanna thank the tech team that has put together um, this series. Um, so I'm going to begin to share my screen because I'm going to use my uh, slides as kind of lecture notes. Um, and so again, uh, I'm so delighted and proud to be part of this series. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate you, class of 2024. Um, what an incredible year to graduate from high school and then come to college. Um, so congratulations to all of you. Um, I also want to welcome you to Penn State and the College of Liberal Arts. You are about to embark on a fantastic voyage and you're going to join an incredible community. Um, and I assure you that you're going to meet some fantastic people here from staff to students to faculty. And of course, I look forward to having you in my classes. Um, I teach two to three classes um, every year. And in the fall, I will be teaching a philosophy of law. So if you're interested in the philosophy of law, um, I hope to see you in that class. So let me give you a little bit, bit of background. Philosophy generally is divided into two big branches. Um, one is called theoretical philosophy and the other branch is called practical, sometimes called applied philosophy. Under the theoretical, we have these heady subdisciplines of metaphysics, ontology, theology, epistemology, the philosophy of mathematics, the philosophy of language, and of course, the philosophy of mind. Under the applied section, we have things like aesthetics, which is the philosophy of art, ethics, political philosophy, law or jurisprudence, pedagogy, social philosophy, and of course, the philosophy of history. Now, the philosophy of language, which is what I'm gonna be talking about, is a unique branch of philosophy because it is both theoretical and practical. It is theoretical because it asks a fundamental question. What is language? Um, is it a syntax? Is it a semantics? Is it its pragmatics? It has also a fascinating question. Do all languages share one deep structure? Um, and if there is a deep structure to all languages, what does it look like? Um, uh, 
Penn State, we have a department that deals with these questions in a very scientific way. Um, this is the Department of Applied Linguistics. And if you're interested in this kind of question, you could join this department and major in applied linguistics. But the philosophy of language is also practical because it asks us about, um, or it asks the question, um, how is it that language conditions the way in which we interact with each other? Um, language is not just communication. It is also a way of um, interacting, of acting, of making. Um, when we use language, we are doing things um, um, with our world, uh, with our bodies. Like right now, I'm, I'm talking, but I'm using my hands. Um, and furthermore, how do we use language to either obfuscate or clarify, to persuade or to dissuade? Um, and, and so language has this practical or applied dimension. And in fact, we have a fantastic department in our College of Liberal Arts, Communications, Arts and Sciences that explores some aspects of this. Within philosophy, um, the question of language um, has lately been studied under the uh, rubric of hermeneutics. Now, arguably, furthermore, you could say that um, Western philosophy begins with a debate about philosophy's relationship with language. Um, is philosophy just another form of rhetoric, sophistry, or is it another form of a science, a kind of knowledge that is uh, transcendent, that goes beyond our dependence on language? Um, and if we think about the beginnings of Western philosophy, um, we begin with this in fantastic debates between the sophists, um, which were pre-Socratic philosophers, and Socrates, um, debates that were staged in some of the works produced by Plato. Um, and in fact, there's a way in which we can read the Platonic dialogues as this great staging of this debate about whether philosophy can be dependent or independent of language. Um, but fortunately, we don't have to take sides. We have someone who um, created a fantastic bridge between the sophists and the Platonist uh, thinkers. And this is Aristotle, who, as a matter of fact, wrote several books um, dealing with language, but the most famous ones are rhetoric and poetics. Um, and I would like to use Aristotle as a way to um, launch some of the ideas that I want to uh, present to you and really have a conversation with you um, during the Q&A. First, um, in what is uh, certainly one of the most important works of moral philosophy, the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle provides us with a, a very important definition of what it means to be human. And there he says that we are suam politicon. This says, this means that we are political animals, um, which is a really important definition because what he means by this is that the human cannot flourish outside a community, and in particular, a political community. We accomplish our essence, if you will, within a community. Now, he takes this definition and in his politics, um, he expands it. He gives it a, a little more of nuance. And he says there that not only are we are political animals, but we are so on, echon, logon. That means that we are animals that possess language. Sometimes some commentators say that it also could be read as animals possessed by language, which is a really wonderful definition that adds more kick, if you will, more spice to that other definition that we are political animals. Because for Aristotle, language is the means through which we can express something, whether something is painful or pressurable. But he says, the most important aspect of language is that it allows us to talk about that which is collectively advantageous or harmful. And what he means by that is that language 
is the way in which we can express that which is just or unjust. So to be a political animal is to be an animal that has language and one of the supreme goals of language is to be able to name justice. Um, and I think this is a very important uh, foundation for all kinds of thinking that define you know, the, the best of Western philosophy, if you will. Now, this insight of Aristotle that language is fundamental to our political life um, was given a really interesting um, footnote, if you will, um, in the 20th century by uh, Austrian philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. And he says that language is a form of life. Language does not just communicate, it expresses and um, forms, it, gave, it gives sense, it conditions um, a form of life. So language isn't only an expression, it also is a condition of possibility. And, and so language is imbricated with all kinds of other practices. Um, Another way to express what Wittgenstein was saying is that um, we can think of language as the medium is the message, to use that wonderful phrase from Marshall McLuhan. Um, and that is that how we talk about something conditions how we think about it, how we think about something is manifest in our language. And in that sense, we can say that language is always a form of contagion. Um, and this brings me to that other wonderful phrase that Jenna quoted at the beginning that comes from the American writer William Burroughs. Um, and um, if you haven't read William Burroughs, I highly recommended him. I highly recommend him. He's uh, one of the beat writers, a very good friend with Allen Ginsberg. Um, and during the late 60s, um, he was experimenting with automatic um, writing. Um, and he came up with this um, great phrase that language is a virus. But um, um, Burroughs was actually making a commentary on the then uh, raging war in Vietnam. Um, and he wanted to make uh, some observations about the language that we were using to talk about the war in Vietnam. Um, Laurie Anderson, by the way, has done a beautiful video uh, with this phrase. Um, so if you are into performance artists, I recommend that you look up Laurie Anderson, language is a virus. Um, but what Boros was saying is something that we already had learned from George Orwell um, when he talks about how language has political consequences. Um, and so language is not only political, and I would say more precisely biopolitical because the kind of language that we use uh, influences and determines how we see people who um, ought to be killed or let um, die um, and, and so on. So I, know, I think the better example here would be to think about hate speech. Um, and we regulate legally hate speech um, because essentially language has biopolitical consequences. So with that kind of um, preface, um, I think we are in a deep, profound need to reflect on the kind of language that we're using right now to either conceal or make evident, to obfuscate or to clarify, to disguise or mask the basic issues of fairness, urgency, and in general collective sacrifice that this crisis is demanding of all of us um, and thus, um, in the next um, 20 minutes or so, I would like to take up some of the key words and um, see what is lurking. Language 
has political consequences, but language has also what we can say, what we can call an unconscious. Um, and so we need to be aware of what is lurking in what we sometimes take to be innocent words. So le let me begin with the most obvious one. So we are using the language of social distancing in order to flatten the curve. Um, and I'm delighted that uh, Roy, uh, in his lecture last week, talked about the false dichotomy of flattening the curve and opening the economy. Uh, opening the economy is another really interesting term, but um, I just want to linger a little bit on social distancing, because at first blush, this seems like what we need to do. But um, everyone has a phenomenological understanding, that is to say, a lived experience, that this is not what is happening. Um, if anything, we are socially de-distancing. For the most part, we're always, um, you know, going along our lives and occasionally once a month we call our parents and so on and so forth. But um, under the conditions of this pandemic, what we are doing is, um, as I note in my PowerPoint, falling back into the thickness, warm intimacy and proximity of our social existence. We have been reaching out, we have been writing letters, we have been um, texting friends, we have been calling, um, you know, children, parents, and so on. Um, and, and, and so this is not really social distancing. What we're doing is physical distancing. Um, and we should name it for what it is. Um, I should know that I began reflecting on some of these key terms because back in January and February, I was actually in Germany. And there, they don't use this language. In Germany, they say, stand back um, or stay back so that tomorrow we can embrace, which is a really, really interesting um, way to talk about it. Stand back so that tomorrow we can embrace, um, which is not about social distancing, it's about physical distancing. Um, now, why I, I want to begin with this word is because what is the social in social distancing? Well, the social are the hospitals, the public um, schools, the libraries, the unemployment benefits, all of these that what we call social services. And so when we use the expression social distancing, I want to flag that perhaps what we are being asked to do is begin to take distance from social services. Um, and we have to be alert. We have to be careful that we are not letting ourselves be lulled into thinking that when we're asked to do social distancing, what we're doing is also learning to let go of the social in our society. In fact, when we use the language of social distancing, we are perhaps preparing ourselves to accept Margaret Thatcher, and I will answer questions why <laughs> I brought this name up, but she said something really fascinating back when neoliberalism got launched, and that uh, she said there is no such thing as a society. Um, well, a pandemic is perhaps the best way to demonstrate that we are a society, that there are societies, and that we depend on them. So that was one word that really got me thinking. The other one uh, is this, well, actually a couple of words here, economic and financial time. Econo economic time refers to the time in which we're making, earning money and saving money. Um, and then financial time refers to the time or timeline of our debts, um, our school loans, our car payments, our mortgages, um, our business loans, and so on and so forth. And what we are living through right now in this pandemic is the uncoupling, the um, delinkings, if you will, of economic and financial time. 
economic time has come to a ground halt and financial time keeps chugging along. Um, I think this is really important that we understand this, but you know, before there is economic and financial time, there is the time of life. In Germany, um, or in German, this is called Lebenszeit, or the lifetime. Um, our economic time and our financial time is only one part of our lifetime or our living time or the time of life. You know, we have this wonderful uh, saying, um, we don't live to work, we work to live. So before there is financial time and economic time, there is the time of life. Um, I also want to suggest that we actually already have in our lexicon a term that gets at this. Um, so when we think about Levenzeit, lifetime, um, we have coined this term, which is actually used by um, economists to measure the justness and fairness of a society. And that is called life expectancy. So when someone starts talking to you about economic time and financial time, say, what about life expectancy? Who has um, what kind of life expectancy? The, the other term that um, has been used, and I'm so glad that uh, Michael Berube um, used it the other day, um, he, he used the word vector. And this is um, the term that has been used to talk about the spread of the coronavirus. Now, if we look on the OED, the Oxford English Dictionary, there we find an illuminating uh, definition. It comes from the Latin vector, which means agent, and it's a noun. It also means to carry, to carry. Um, and then he mentioned the Spanish vector, um, not surprised there because Spanish comes from Latin. Um, essentially, vector means what carries. In an, in an epidemic, the vector um, it carries the virus and the virus has its own vector. In mechanics, um, we talk about a vector as a representation of some inertia, some force, some velocity or some acceleration. Um, and, and, and so vector can also be a representation of a lines of force, of movement, of displacement. Um, and this is why in astronomy, we talk about radius vector. Um, and what I wanna say is that we should not forget that the vector of the virus is us. We are the carriers. We carry the, 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 the virus. We are the vectors, but in particular because of the trajectory of our global, global social existence, which also demonstrates our biological interdependence. We are the carriers of the virus and our social interdependence is the vector that illuminates and shows its um, line of contagion, if you will. Another word that has been used to talk about the virus, um, and it has also been challenged, but it's a word that has been used, is that viruses are foreign. Um, that, you know, most viruses um, come from some other place. Um, and um, as uh, Michael Berube pointed out, there's a, a rhetorical tendency to always want to blame someone else for the virus. But as the lecture that began this, um, this lecture series um, argue, viruses are endemic to life. Arguably, the history of humanity is a virological history, the history of our symbiosis with all kinds of viruses. Um, 
to be a biological entity is by necessity to have learned to survive and coexist and overcome and develop immunities to these creatures um, that are DNA randomizers and what I call RNA pirates. Um, they're always pillaging life and um, the DNA from our own um, biological um, systems. Viruses are not foreign. Um, they're part of life. Um, in fact, uh, we ought to think about um, instead of viral, viral um, foreignness, we ought to think about viral pedagogy. Um, we are our viruses. Um, our bodies um, bear the trace. We have the stigmata of all kinds of viruses. Um, and our immunological systems have developed by uh, you know, meeting, dealing, treating all kinds of viruses. Um, and here, what I would say is that um, anthropogenesis, or better yet, anthropomorphosis, the making of the human through evolution and through culture, is the history of our interaction um, with all kinds of bodies and interaction between bodies and among bodies. Um, and that's why I, I think that we ought to think of our bodies literally as the geology of life. That includes, of, of course, viruses. Um, this wonderful term, which by the way, I have to confess, I did not know until this pandemic, um, zo zoonotic. Zoonotic is an adjective. Um, that comes from the noun zoonosis. The term refers to the kinds of viruses um, that the COVID family of viruses belongs to, or they have a very particular characteristic. Um, and generally, it's meant to refer to that kinds of viruses that jump from animals to humans. Um, and generally, uh, it's from another better break to um, as vertebrates, um, and it was first used in, in German and then taken up by French, and we took it from the French, um, and it brings to, to get together two words um, from the Greek zoo, animal, and noosis, which means uh, disease. Um, and so um, animals and the diseases of animals, but the term though has a very technical characteristic, could also be misleading because we are animals um, and we cannot not carry our own viruses. In fact, the history of our of becoming pandemics is also the history in which we have interacted with our animals. And here, um, I wanna bring up something that um, Michael and I were exchanging um, uh, over email after his lectures on, on his lecture on Tuesday, is that, as I said, the history of humanity is the history of our survival of pandemics, um, and thus is also the history of the biological warfare that we have uh, unleashed against one another, but also animals. And here, um, I want to recall one of the most devastating events biological events in the history of humanity and the planet. And that is what has been disingenuously called the Colombian exchange, which is uh, a term that refers to that massive exchange of flora, fauna, humans, viruses that took place when the Europeans began to travel to the new world, bringing slaves um, from Africa. Um, but what most people forget is that that so-called, euphemistically called, encounter um, created a pandemic that decimated the native populations of the New World. Almost three quarters of the native populations of the New World were wiped out by the viruses that the Europeans came. Um, what is interesting about the Colombian exchange is that it also demonstrates how Europeans had co-evolved 
with their um, animals, horses, cows, pigs, rats, and so on and so forth. Um, so zoonosis is always biopolitical. Um, and we should not forget that we are animals ourselves. We are carriers as well. Um, I would like to expand more uh, on that term, perhaps in the Q and A. Um, but um, there are so many terms that I could have gone on, such as, for instance, disappear, as in the virus will disappear. Viruses don't disappear; um, they mutate, and we develop uh, immunities, antibodies, but they linger. This is why every fall we get, you know, the flu. Um, another term that has been really fascinating in related to the responses to the uh, pandemic is deep state. Another term is solidarity. Um, a term that I think that has been um, quite absent from the rhetoric of our uh, officials in Washington um, is gratitude. Um, what um, I found really uh, striking was that in Germany, um, uh, the president and Chancellor Merkel, way back in early March, were already expressing gratitude to all the essential workers that were going to be, so to say, on the front lines. At risk is a really interesting term, precondition, essential worker. You know, who are the essential workers? Um, how are they essential when in fact we treat them as the most disposable and dispensable types of people? And then the question of immunity um, has been used, whether people are developing immunities and whether we could find, find um, discover, invent um, an inoculation that would render us immune to, vir to this virus. Um, but I invite you to send me an email if you think that there are um, other terms out there that you've seen that are really peculiar, interesting, duplicitous, ambiguous, um, that insinu insinuate more than they're um, apparently trying to communicate. So I want to close by invoking two sentences um, or two phrases. One, rhetorical authorship. And this is a term that was often used by Richard Rorty. Um, he always talked about that the kinds of languages, vocabularies that we use, um, either constrain or expand the sense of justice um, that we extend or retract. But he was really um, interested in how can we assert our rhetorical authorship over the vocabularies that we use. And the other one is, um, um, well, I'm sorry, I, I'm conflating. Rhetorical authorship is a term by Susan Sontag um, that she coins towards the end of her wonderful book, AIDS and its metaphors. Um, and semantic authority is the term that uh, Rorty used throughout his many writings on language and, and so on and so forth. And so I would like to invoke, I would like to compel, I would like to persuade you to engage in some, some bit of semantic authority and rhetorical authorship over the language that you're using to talk about the pandemic. Um, and here uh, I brought up two quotes. Um, one is by Gorgias of Leontini, he is one of the, uh, possibly one of the most famous uh, sophists. He showed, you know, in fact, Plato wrote a, a dialogue with his name. Um, and he had this um, claim that I found really fascinating, but you can read it right there. The other one, um, and perhaps we can end there, is this sentence or two sentences from, from um, George Orwell. Um, one is that it, the English language, becomes ugly and inaccurate because our thoughts are foolish, but the slovenliness of our language makes it easier for us to have foolish thoughts. 
And then later on in this wonderful essay, Politics in the English Language, he says, but if thought corrupts language, language can also corrupt thought. I would like to paraphrase that last sentence and say that if politics corrupts language, language can also corrupt politics. And therefore, I would urge you precisely to, um, you know, claim semantic uh, authority and rhetorical authorship over the kind of language. Um, and with, with that, um, I want to thank you. Great. Well, uh, thank you uh, so much, Eduardo. I love that notion of, of semantic authority. And I think that, you know, going back to what you were saying about McLuhan and the, the medium is the message. We all have the medium now on our social media accounts. I think you could argue in some ways we perhaps have more semantic authority as individuals than we ever have at any other point in our, in our history. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's, that's a really interesting concept to, to think about. Um, we have one question that has has come in so far that really I think picks up on the, this point you were just making about uh, the the relationship between language and politics. Um, wondering about your perspective on the use of war or battle like terminology as it relates to the the virus. Things like we're going we're going to beat it and we can win the fight. And um, you know what what do you make of of those? types of, of phrases given this framework that you've just laid out? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the term uh, rhetorical authorship from Susan Sontag comes from this book that she wrote called AIDS and its met metaphors. Um, but there's another earlier book called Illness as Metaphor. And in these two books, she sets out to, to argue against using the um, language, the metaphor of war against a disease. Whenever we use the language of war, we're preparing for all kinds of, um, uh, of cost without supervision. Um, we're preparing ourselves to surrender our authority, our critical capacities. Um, and um, I think that the language of war um, is not appropriate. In fact, we should stay away from the language of war when we're talking about fighting a pandemic. Um, and um, yes, so that's, that's what I would say at the moment. So is there an, an overtly political motive then when, when our and leaders or others, you know, deliberately choose to use that language to, yes. to frame our situation? Yeah, because what they're asking for is a carte blanche. Um, and when, when we are fighting a war, we all become patriotic. And we need to be patriotic, but not in that sense. And that's, I think that here, using other languages is perhaps more useful. And it doesn't ask us, to surrender um, our sense of we need, we're in this together. This is a, a thing that the whole community has to be involved. Um, yeah. Right, and that's, yeah, that's interesting that, you know, in, in the American context, that's what we associate. We associate war with that we're all in this together as opposed to a, a different conjuring of a social good or, you know, something like that. Uh, um, when you had your, your list of words up, another one that I that had come to mind for me was empathy. I think yeah. something that you know we've perhaps maybe also been been missing in some of our, our framing or some of the, the language that's been used to talk about this virus publicly. Um, Correct. But you know, so thinking about also your use of the the phrase social distance. Um, you know, I, I think your your summation about why it's it's problematic was was excellent and and spot on. I'm wondering. How you know, given all of the the problems, which it doesn't really take a whole lot to 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 get there when you just think about it for a little bit, but how does a term like that spread, even though it is on its face seemingly inaccurate, but yet it still kind of becomes part of how we talk about it anyway? So how does how does that happen? Well, uh, this is the unconscious of language, and this is the politics of language. Um, I think that. Why is it that the Germans did not say 
began to use that language. They simply used the language of Suruk Blyben or Suruk Stan. They didn't say social and federal, like stand back socially. That, that doesn't make sense for them in the language. Um, and part of it, I think, is ideological. I think that we're being prepared to then say, okay, social distancing means we have to, you know, shut down certain social services. Um, um, and we have to be mindful that, you know, the social um, is a burden. And we are being prepared to give sacrifice that which actually allows us to be together. Um, and so that's why um, I think we ought to uh, retire that term and simply use uh, physical distancing. Because as I said, um, we all have a phenomenological experience that that's not what we're doing. Right. And if folks are interested in that, that particular um, concept, I would, I would recommend uh, the work of the sociologist Eric Kleinenberg. I've been reading him uh, quite a bit uh, lately. He has a book called Going Solo that, that talks about um, some of these, these themes you've been, been hitting on. Yeah. Um, so if, if others have questions, you can feel free to, to type them in the, the Q&A box. Um, you know, another word that, that came to mind uh, as, as you were giving your, your talk, Eduardo, I was thinking a lot about the word mask and how that is um, being, being used. I mean, it's, it's, I guess, on one hand, a, a physical thing that we wear, but I wonder, um, you know, what other, what other connotations that might have or, or if, that was, if that's a word that you, you had considered um, as, as you were thinking about the, the language of this pandemic. Um, no, it wasn't a word that I, I had uh, wanted to do an exegesis. It's not a word that I wanted to deconstruct, but obviously we can go with it. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I, so I'm an avid reader of The New Yorker, and the, I think it was The New Yorker, maybe, yes, um, where in France, um, people are being asked to wear masks, but not, you know, the kind of mask, mask that um, Muslims wear. Um, and so if we're supposed to be wearing masks, why not any kind of mask? Like, is there going to be a mask police? Yeah. So, yeah, um, I think um, it is important that we wear masks. And, and it's certainly one of the measures that we ought to be following to prevent the further spread of the virus. Um, yeah. Right. I'll have to think more about it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we can, we can pick it up some other time. Um, so uh, going back to, to what we were saying about um, social distancing versus physical distancing, um, we are at the point now where people are literally thinking about how best to step out of the house. You know, here in Center County, we're moving into the green phase tomorrow. Uh, so people are going to be going out to do things like get their haircuts, go to restaurants, and, and start to return to some kind of new normal. Um, so what, what's your, your take on this kind of open up language? Or you, you, you hit on it briefly with the you know, reopen the economy, but what about this, this notion of opening back, you know, going back to how things were before March of this year versus the, the kind of new normal? I've, I've heard things kind of, I've heard it described both ways. Yeah, um, I, I really like what Roy said last week about this false dichotomy. Um, I also like social distancing talking about opening up the economy as though we folded it up and closed it down is, I think, misleading. Because we're not simply gonna open up and you know, let the thing come out um, as though we had put it on hibernation. The, the economy will have to be restructured. Um, and so opening gives the sense of Oh, it's just there in nerve. You know, I get my Amazon.com box and I open it up and voila, that's not going to happen. Everything is going to be different. If anything, 
I would say that what we need to do is restructure the economy. We will have to um, rewire the economy. Uh, another term that, that I, I analyze is this notion of um, that were being used in, in March and April when Congress was passing the, the bills. And they were told, they, were, they, they use different language. They would talk about relief, stimulus. Um, I, I forget, there's, a, there's another term right now that um, was often used. And no one has used the term rescue, right? I think that given the immensity of the economic impact to our economy and to the young, young generation, we ought to be thinking uh, as a rescue package, something like uh, a Marshall Plan for our time. And, and you don't open up an economy and, and that has gone through that severe shock. You restructure it and you give it an incredible rescue package. So right, that's, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, I think we could think about maybe the, the New Deal as kind of a similar thing. This is something new, not yeah. necessarily, yeah. Um, so uh, you, you're talking about the, the Amazon box uh, segues into another question we've uh, received here. So um, people have also been talking a lot about luck throughout the, the pandemic. So we're lucky that we could work from home. We're lucky that we haven't been exposed to anyone with, with the, the virus. Um, so can you just, just talk about this, this notion of, of, of luck and whether it's, it might perhaps be misguided when it, when it comes to thinking of, about something like a virus? Yeah, I, like social distancing, like opening up the economy. I think talking about luck is uh, very disingenuous and also concealing um, that certain people don't get infected and that some do is not a matter of luck. Um, that some people um, are able to overcome having been infected and then perhaps develop antibodies is not a matter of luck. Um, when we're dealing with viruses and pandemics, um, it's not a question of luck because that, that um, let's, people who are responsible of the hook. Um, it's about what kinds of measures we have come up with across the nation to deal with sudden, um, you know, influx of patients into hospitals. Um, the, the, that New York um, became one of the epicenters of the pandemic in the United States is not a question of luck or bad luck. Um, it's a question that New York over the last three decades has undergone a political economy of austerity and all of those hospitals in Brooklyn were essentially stripped down to bare bones. And, and then you had to send in the, uh, the Navy to, to help them. But that's, that wasn't bad luck or good luck, it was the result of biopolitical policies saying, you know, we don't care working class people in Brooklyn. Um, so we're going to dismantle uh, public hospitals. Um, yeah. Right. Um, have you, have you observed or, or thought about um, any generational differences surrounding um, some of these terms, you know, thinking perhaps uh, particularly about the, the, the rescue versus return, um, you know, older generations might be more interested in, in return type of language, whereas younger generations might be more forward thinking and, and more apt to think about things in that, that rescue type of frame. Yeah, um, that's an excellent question. I, to be honest, they, I haven't really thought about in terms of generational. I was so focused on what this means for this generation. Um, because in contrast to other pandemics, um, the impact has been so intense. We don't even know yet how long it's gonna take us to recover and to reconstruct 
our um, our economy and, and some of our basic institutions. Um, so um, I, I really haven't looked at it. Um, I also would say that because of what you mentioned at the beginning, the age of social media, um, I think that this generation is dealing with it in so, it's so different. Um, so when we had some of the pandemics like the SARS a couple of years ago, um, I don't remember this level of awareness um, and discussion and, and so on. So uh, maybe it was because back then I wasn't paying attention to, to uh, social media or, or trying to keep track of what's going on. So um, my starting point was comparing what the Europeans were doing as opposed to what we were doing in the United States and noticing the difference in the political language circulating in the public spheres. Sure. So, uh, and speaking of that, of, of political language, so are, are there other motivations um, for, or maybe perhaps the, the better way to phrase this, what other motivations might political leaders have for choosing the language that they, they do. For example, you know, the, the way that, that President Trump has been talking about the pandemic, I mean, is, isn't that also maybe just as much to shape perception of, of him as a leader as opposed to how people think about the, the virus itself? Yeah, correct. I think that that's spot, you know, right on. Um, I think that the language that politicians use in part to obfuscate, but also in part to escupate, um, to render themselves um, inoculated to criticism. Um, and, and so absolutely, I mean, that's for me, it was so clear, it's so stark, the contrast between the European leaders and our White House in how they talked about it. It was just like I live, was living in two different worlds. Um, so, yeah. Right. Well, and, and to that point about the, the differences between countries, um, you, you certainly you know, talked about the difference between English and, and German, but um, are, there, are there differences even within English speaking countries? So things like social distancing or opening or reopening the economy, are, are there differences in, in how those terms are, are used or interpreted in the UK, Australia, other English speaking countries? Um, no, I haven't paid attention to what uh, is going on in, in Britain or Australia for that matter. Um, one of the things that I have been doing over the last uh, couple of months is keeping a diary with, it's a collective diary with a couple of friends. One of them is in Spain. And, and so we are reflecting on the differences between what the Spanish, um, the Germans and the Americans are, are saying and what kinds of languages. But I haven't paid attention to, to be honest, how the uh, British are dealing with, with the, the pandemic. Um, right. Um, so there's, there's a, a question here as well about the, the conflation of the terms economy and financial, um, to trying to maybe take the best of, of each one to, to, to shape a singular narrative or, or create a singular news story, but they're, they're, they're different. I mean, thinking about the, the economy versus whether it's, it's, it's personal finance or an individual organization's finances are, are different. And the um, question is, is this maybe a current version of there are good people on both yeah. sides or, or how could this, this better be addressed in the news and, and through the media? Right. Uh, that's, that's also a, a very, very good point. Very perceptive. Um, I think that... Um, when we pay attention to the language that is being used to talk about the economy, um, that there are kind of dog whistles there that certain people are not 
uh, responsible economic agents. Um, and, and so it's obfuscating that, that, that a lot of things in the economy have, uh, you know, sort of fallen out of sync. Um, so, um, I mean, my kids, for instance, just began their professional careers and they lost their jobs. And they, who knows how long it's gonna be before they can find a job and then begin to develop a portfolio and, and so on and so forth. Um, most, you know, if you pay attention to all of the journalism, economic journalism, you will discover that, you know, an incredible number of Americans are living from paycheck to paycheck. Why is that? Well, we have one of the lowest, um, you know, base salaries, you know? So if you're a working class person, you have a family and you're working on minimum wage, how much leftover money are you gonna to have to put it away in savings? Um, so yeah, it, we have to be very careful about the language that we use, especially when we're talking about having to reconstruct the economy um, and who are the essential. The essential workers are also the least paid, the, the, the worst paid, the ones with the l less, least uh, um, access to kinds of things that would create a cushioning, whether it be, you know, unemployment benefits or healthcare uh, benefits and, and so on and so forth. Yes. Well, well, right. And, you know, I think that that also brings to mind some of that language around you, you mentioning reconstruct. Are we going to go back to the system that we had before this, which as you just articulated was perhaps broken in some ways, or, or are we going to use this, this moment as an opportunity perhaps, or to, to rethink or, you know, reevaluate some of, of these structures that have led to inequality of, of all sorts and, and these things you, you've just been describing. Um, um, yeah, that's the, I use the term viral pedagogy, learning from the virus. And I meant it in, in the biological sense that our bodies literally, but as a society, we ought to learn from this virus, that our society should also undergo a learning process. And, and that so many Americans were standing at the brink of an economic precipice that just required a little push and we fell into it. That's just unacceptable. Um, when we compare what the Europeans have done to make sure that people don't fall out of the employment sector into the unemployment, it's really telling. Um, also that there they have, uh, whether it be Germany or France or you know, Northern European countries, um, socialized medicine, social, socialized healthcare, um, which means that even if you lose your job, you don't lose your um, health care benefits. And that's a really important, I think, lesson that we have learned um, from, well, one of the important lessons. Uh, yeah. Right. Well, I think that is, that is a good place to, to leave our conversation for today, that notion of, of learning from this and the, the myriad ways that that can occur moving forward. Um, so, um, I'd like to thank you for, for your time, Eduardo, for that, that excellent lecture. Thank you. Um, and we hope that uh, all of you will join us on Tuesday at 3 p.m. for the final lecture in the Pandemic 101 series, which will explore the impact of COVID-19 on garment workers and will be presented by Mark Anner of the School of Labor and Employment Relations. Um, and finally, uh, to learn more, uh, to learn more, uh, about the College of the Liberal Arts and schedule a virtual meeting with our recruitment coordinator, you can visit la.psu.edu and look for prospective students. So I'm Jenna Spinelli. Thank you so much for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day.